Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Just a couple of quick announcements today related to the Twimmel online meetup. First, the video from our December meetup has been posted and it's now available on our YouTube channel and at twimmelai.com meetup. It was a great meetup. So if you missed it, you'll definitely want to check it out. But you definitely don't want to miss our next meetup either. On Tuesday, January 16th at 3 o'clock Pacific, we'll be joined by Microsoft Research's Timnit Gebru, who will be presenting her paper, Using Deep Learning and Google Street View to Estimate the Demographic Makeup of Neighborhoods Across the United States, which has received national media attention for some of its findings. Timnit will be digging into those results, as well as the pipeline she used to identify 22 million cars and 50 million Google Street View images. I'm anticipating a very lively discussion segment as well to kick off the session, so make sure to bring your AI resolutions and predictions for 2018. For links to the paper or to join the meetup group, visit twimmelai.com meetup. All right, on to today's show. In this episode, we hear from Kenneth Stanley, professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Central Florida and senior research scientist at Uber AI Labs. Kenneth studied under Twimmel Talk number 47 guest Risto Mikulainen at UT Austin after Geometric Intelligence, the company he co-founded with Gary Marcus and others, was acquired in late 2016. Kenneth's research focus is neuroevolution, which applies the idea of genetic algorithms to the challenge of evolving neural network architectures. In this conversation, we discuss the Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies, or NEAT, paper that Kenneth authored along with Risto, which won the 2017 International Society for Artificial Life's Award for Outstanding Paper of the Decade 2002 to 2012. We also cover some of the extensions to that approach he's created since, including HyperNeat, which can efficiently evolve very large neural networks with connectivity patterns that look more like those of the human brain and that are generally much larger than what prior approaches to neural learning could produce, as well as novelty search, an approach that, unlike most evolutionary algorithms, has no defined objective, but rather simply searches for novel behaviors. We also cover concepts like complexification and deception, biology versus computation, and some of his other work, including his book and Nero, a video game complete with real-time neuroevolution. This is a meaty nerd alert interview that I think you'll really enjoy. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone. I am on the line with Kenneth Stanley. Kenneth is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Central Florida, as well as a senior research scientist at Uber AI Labs. Kenneth, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thanks very much. Real happy to be here. Fantastic. Why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. I have been interested in artificial intelligence since I was a little kid, maybe around eight years old. Went on to major in computer science because of that and carried that interest into graduate school where I was at the University of Texas at Austin where I did my PhD. And there I became interested in particular in neural networks, artificial neural networks, which are what are now the basis of deep learning, which everybody's talking about. And also Mm -hmm. what's called evolutionary computation, which means kind of Darwinian type of principles being applied inside of computer algorithms. And so the intersection of those two things is what's called today neuroevolution. So it means like evolving neural networks or like evolving brains, you could think of it as in a computer. And I guess my particular interest is just how brains evolved, you know, these amazing astronomically complex things that are in our heads. I was always fascinated by how an unguided process seemingly unintelligent process like evolution could just produce something so astronomically complex and amazing as our own brains. And so as a neuroevolution researcher, I've been trying to figure out how can you actually make algorithms that would evolve something of similar scale and complexity. Mm. Was there anything in particular that you 
came across at the age of eight or so that got you interested in AI? Yeah, yeah. So at the age of eight, that's when my family bought a computer. It was uh, <laughs> like a Commodore 64. Yes. And it was, it was also, I, I, my parents put me in a, a programming class, and that was on a TRS-80. It was a very old computer system. And Trash 80. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess for some reason, like as a little kid, it just really made an impression on me that I could tell the computer to do anything. Like I had this feeling like there was like infinite freedom in the things that I could get the computer can do to do. Mm. If only I could just figure out how to tell it what I wanted. Right. And I felt like if I could just tell it how to have a conversation with me, then it would basically be my friend or like talk to me. <laughs> and I... I was really, really interested in just getting the computer to have a conversation with me, um, like a casual conversation, like, how are you doing? What's your name? That kind of thing. And at first, I would write really simple programs in BASIC, the BASIC computer language, mm -hmm. that would have like little conversations like this. Like, I'd say, what's your name? I'd say, Ken, like basically in typing, and they would say, hi, Ken. And I mm -hmm. was very impressed that we could have this kind of conversation and that I got it to do that. But I quickly hit a wall where I couldn't get it to like really do anything interesting, you know, it was just a very stock right. scripted thing. And at the time, like around age eight, I thought there's some way to do this that I just need to read a book or something. Like there's something that would just tell me how to get it to have a real conversation with me. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize that this is like one of the greatest problems, like facing humankind, like how to get a computer <laughs> actually be intelligent, like a real person. And it took me a while actually for it to strike me that this is actually like an extremely hard problem. And there's not just like some manual you can read that can get, get the computer to do that. Um, so I probably within a couple of years, I realized this, this is like a huge problem. And then I was really interested and hooked and like, wow, this is actually hard. And like, there's gotta be a way to do this. And I guess I would just stay captivated by that problem like forever. But I guess I changed the shifted a bit in my interest. Cause you know, if you look at that and you look at it from the lens of like today's subfields of artificial intelligence, you'd probably call that natural language processing or something like that. And I, uh -huh. I kind of shifted away from that over time to more like lower level stuff, like control, like neural stuff. Okay. But that was like what initially hooked me into it and got me interested in AI. Interesting. And you mentioned that you studied at UT Austin. I did an interview with, with uh, Ristu Mikulainen. Did you study with him there? Yeah. So I guess it's just a coincidence that uh, Risto is my advisor or was my advisor during the PhD. Okay. So I worked with him for years there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about your primary research focus? Sure. So my primary research focus is in an area called neuroevolution. And it's an area that is probably less well-known in the general public. Like you hear tons of stuff about deep learning today, but you don't hear so much about neuroevolution. It's certainly related to deep learning because both of them are about, in effect, neural networks. But neuroevolution has this twist, which is that we're interested in neural networks, which are, for those who don't know, basically these rough abstractions of what happens in brains. Like, you know, the word neural comes from neurons, and neurons are in our brains. So neural networks are mm -hmm. roughly motivated or inspired by brains in nature, although they're not at all accurate models of them. But then in neuroevolution, we're combining that with evolutionary principles, which really means kind of like breeding. Like if you think about it, like it's like if you had a neural network that does something good, like say drives a robot and makes it able to do a task, like say walk, like it gets your biped robot to walk, then like neuroevolution is kind of like you're breeding those brains. You're saying, okay, I have a bunch of brains. These are artificial brains. We'll call them neural networks though, because artificial brains exaggerates like how cool they are. So see, these are artificial neural <laughs> networks. And we would then look at like well, how well do they get the robot to walk? Like a whole bunch of them, and they call that a population. And then like we choose the ones that do better. Some will do worse and some will do better. And the ones that do better will have children, which basically means like new neural networks will be born as offspring of the old ones that we chose, or we call that selection. We selected those. And our hope is that the offspring of those better ones will sometimes be even better than their parents. And so if we keep on playing this game, which is just breeding, so like it's not hard to understand. Like some areas of AI are kind of complex and hard to stand, understand at first. But intuitively, this is easy because mm -hmm. this is just like breeding horses or breeding dogs. You just choose the ones that are better in, with respect to whatever criteria you have and then just breed them and hope that like things get better over time. And so neuroevolution is basically about breeding these artificial things rather than real organisms, which are these artificial neural networks. And 
thereby getting them to get better over generations. And what is interesting about it to me is that like, while it's like a simple concept in principle, at least like the initial outline that I gave is quite simple just in terms of breeding, like under the hood, there's like real mysteries here because this is really the process, you know, that produced you and me and like the high level of intelligence that we have going all the way back to single celled organisms. And it's quite amazing to believe that like there is some kind of path through that space just through breeding that can lead to something like us from something so humble and simple. Um, And to get algorithms to do that is an enormous challenge and not fully understood right now. Mm -hmm. And that's where kind of the research comes in in the field. Interesting, interesting. And then you're also, again, a senior research scientist at Uber AI Labs. What can you tell us about Uber AI Labs and how that came about and what the charter is there? Right. So there was no Uber AI Labs around nine months ago, but I was one of the co-founders of a startup company called Geometric Intelligence. My co-founders were included Gary Marcus, Zubin Garmani, and Doug Bemis. Some of them really quite well-known and very respected researchers themselves. And we were doing, in geometric intelligence, proprietary machine learning research and developing new technologies and building a team that we were hoping to be a world-class research team. And what happened was that Uber acquired us nine months ago in, in December, and when Uber acquired us, they had partly one of their aspirations was to start an AI lab, like a real research lab in industry that researches the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. Because Uber believes and believed at the time that artificial intelligence is a critical competitive component of the industry where Uber needs to be staying at the cutting edge. And Mm -hmm. Uber has and had before a lot of competence already in machine learning. So it's not like there was nobody here. There were plenty of people here who were very qualified in the field, but they didn't have something that was really a fundamental research lab uh, where they're sort of just really pushing on the cutting edge of AI itself, as opposed to just applying it to internal problems. Like for example, Uber has a team focused already that was focused on autonomous driving. And so they already had that in place, but that's an applied aspect of artificial intelligence. And so the AI lab that was founded off of the company that we started, which we founded, was really intended to be focused more on advancing the algorithms themselves. And so Mm -hmm. what Uber got was basically all at once, like all of these researchers who had this capacity to push forward the field of AI. And so you can kind of think about it roughly in analogy with similar types of research labs at big tech companies like Maybe like something like DeepMind, which was originally acquired by Google, or something like Facebook AI Research, or it's also Google Brain at Google. So there's some rough Mm -hmm. analogy there between us and them. We're much smaller, though, because we're newer. But we have the kind of similar mandates in terms of researching the cutting edge of AI. Okay. And I should say that actually we're going to, we are going to engage with the outside world and the academic community. So you'll be hearing from Uber AI Labs. We're going to be publishing, and we understand that, like, just we cannot be a successful AI lab if we are not engaged with the outside world. So we will be publicizing and publishing some of our work so people can see what we're doing and so that we can communicate with other other researchers and scientists uh, across the world. Mm, Okay, great, great. Can you talk a little bit about the intersection between your work in evolutionary AI and the kind of things that Uber's doing around self-driving cars? Yeah, so I can't get into specifics about what Uber is doing with their self-driving cars for a probably obvious reason, but I can say that mm-hmm. that Uber AI Labs is diverse. I mean, and that was one of the original inspirations behind geometric intelligence or the predecessor of Uber AI Labs was to have a diverse a diverse group that isn't just in one particular fad, which you might say deep learning is, although it's obviously an important one that, that's making a lot of important contributions. But our philosophy was that, you know, we need to not have all our eggs in one basket. And so Uber Labs itself is like that too, in that we have a lot of diversity in terms of the expertise and areas that we cover. And so among those, we clearly are world-class in neuroevolution, which is the field that I just described where I've focused at most of my career. And so this is a particular direction within AI and machine learning that offers some unique 
insights and angles on certain types of problems that other areas might have a different take on. So in terms of like autonomous driving, I mean, it's clear that the idea of the evolution of complexity and how really high level intelligence can be evolved in in terms of complex, large, deep artificial neural networks has a connection in principle to how you could get a really sophisticated controller for a vehicle or something like that. And so the insights of the field of neuroevolution, both directly, which means like using neuroevolution itself as an algorithm, and indirectly in terms of insights that we gain as a side effect of doing experiments in that area, can impact how we would create algorithms that might control things like autonomous vehicles. But I should also note that like, it's not that it's not the case that the only application or the, even necessarily the, the main application of AI at Uber is in that area. I mean, Uber has AI problems across the gamut of all of their business components. So there's a lot of different applications mm-hmm. that, are, that are under consideration when it comes to like AI labs and what AI labs does. Sure. So can you talk a little bit about, the, about how your research focus kind of compares and contrasts with what Risto is doing down at UT Austin? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, actually, we're, there's a lot of overlap because, I mean, I'm I'm his advisee, so sure. I've taken a lot of the original teachings that he gave me as the basis of my career and obviously collaborated with him for years to publish some of the, in, in, in the end, it turned out to be some of the seminal papers in the area, both together. And so, you know, I think we're not actually so different in terms of, like, the fields that we're interested in. Where we may differ is more just in like what particular algorithms have we contributed to inventing since we parted ways when I basically graduated with a PhD. And so, you know, he's focused on his own set of innovations and I've focused on my own. And there's some divergence there, but, you know, I, we really ultimately inter- tend to be very close because like when I've invented new things, like when I was at and I'm still at the University of Central Florida. As a professor, Risto would, would sometimes build on those things and vice versa. So we're very intertwined. Mm-hmm. And it's not a surprise since we started out in the same area. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so folks that are interested in maybe some of the background on, you know, you talked about the kind of breeding process at a really high level. Risto and I spent quite a bit of time digging into that in more detail you know, so folks that are interested in that might want to refer back to to that podcast since you've graduated and, and now that you're kind of driving your own research agenda, like what are some of the specific algorithms that you've published research on and, you know, how do they build on kind of that, the core ideas of you know, genetic or evolutionary computing or algorithms? Yeah, sure. So, so in neuroevolution, which is this idea of evolving neural networks. Like one of the interesting things is that when what we're, at least for me, what I find really interesting is not just optimization. Like a lot of people in machine learning think in terms of optimization, which means just like, how do you get this, this structure to get better and better and better with respect to a task? But I'm also interested in what you might call complexification, which means like, how do we get increasing complexity? Like the thing that really fascinates Mm. me is like how in nature things got more complex, like insanely more complex, not just like a little bit of incremental increases in complexity, but like from a single celled organism to something that has in our brain, a hundred trillion connections among a hundred billion cells approximately or a hundred billion neurons. And that's just amazing to me that like some kind of unguided process could build something like that. This is not something that was engineered. And so I'm I'm sort of always have my eye on like what is it that allows really high level astronomical levels of complexity to emerge from this kind of process, this kind of automated process. And so the interesting thing in neuroevolution is that every time it seems like we have an advance where we kind of figure out something about how do you get increasing complexity to happen inside of an algorithm? And we've made some advances, in, including the first thing that I did in grad school, which was this algorithm called NEAT, or Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies, which I did with Risto, which was basically an algorithm about how can we have the neural networks that are evolving in the computer increase in complexity over the course of the algorithm running in the computer. 
And it was because I had this real fascination with increasing complexity that it led to us introducing this algorithm that increases complexity. But then what's interesting is that every time we make an advance like that, it sort of under uncovers some like deeper underlying question. Because it turns out that like the explanation for why it was possible to get from one cell to trillions is really, really subtle and nuanced and complicated. And when you say that, are you speaking biologically or from a, in a computational context? Right. Good question. Yeah. So actually, those things constantly get intertwined in my mind, <laughs> like whether I'm thinking biologically or, or computationally. Because, you know, the way I look at it is kind of like that biology and computation aren't really necessarily different things. Like, in effect, like, if you read a biology textbook, you know, you feel like you're reading about biology. But right. like in effect, it's also about computers because – or at least algorithms, you know, because you're talking about a principled process that basically follows some some certain kinds of rules. And Just so these like, analog computers that we really don't understand very well. Yeah, you could think of like the universe as a big analog computer we don't really understand. <laughs> and and so like – I mean, but like evolution is a very algorithmic thing. You know, you're, you're talking about there are individuals and those individuals reproduce and then the thing that – and who gets to reproduce is based on a formula which is which is obviously complicated but basically some, some individuals reproduce, some, some don't. And this can be formalized as basically like a program. You could imagine writing the rules of the system. And this is what inspired the field of evolutionary computation. I mean, people saw the theories of evolution in biology and thought like, you know what, this is actually not that hard to write down as a program and, and actually make evolution happen artificially inside of a computer. Mm -hmm. And it turned out, though, that like if you just read a textbook and then, you know, learn these principles that sound like good explanatory principles for like how evolution worked. Like if you read a biology text, it's like, well, that they know how it worked. That's an explanation. It turns out that explaining something is easier than actually implementing it, which is basically something that we found across the field of artificial intelligence. You know, you can read about, you can read a neuroscience textbook and say, this is how brains work. Of course, mm -hmm. biologists will acknowledge we don't know everything, but, but this is what we understand now. And it's a pretty right. comprehensive explanation. But it's far, far away from like telling you how to actually build a brain. So you don't know how to build a brain just because we have some understanding of how brains work. It's mm -hmm. the same with evolution. Like we don't know how to build a true evolutionary system at the scale and magnitude of what happens on Earth, even though we know a lot of the details about what goes on. And the missing details, like the gap between what we understand and what we can actually build, that's where the research is, and that's where like a lot of fascinating insights occur. And like to me, I think that to some extent, like when we make advances in artificial intelligence, we're actually learning something about biology in a sense because we're realizing that there are, that the gaps in our knowledge, like what we didn't understand, are actually filled by something that we didn't expect or that wasn't in the textbook about how things work. And it's true that sometimes we may be doing things that are not actually the same as biology, but at least they're revealing gaps in our knowledge of biology because like if in some sense, if we actually knew everything about how things work, then we could just program it in, but we clearly don't. And so it's kind of right. like, I think AI has like a higher bar in a, in a way than biology, where in biology, like you can explain something or statistically analyze it, but in AI, you actually, actually, actually have to build it, which is much, much harder. So mm -hmm. it sort of forces us to grapple with the problems of the gaps in our knowledge in biology. Now, some people in AI would just sort of like say, not like that, that way of looking at things, because some people in AI don't care about the biology, and they just want to build intelligent things, and they don't really care, do these things correspond or not with biology? Like, that's not the goal. The goal is just to build intelligent things. We, we aren't right. like adherent to biology or not. I tend to be more biologically inspired, but I, I also agree that like, I, I don't really necessarily ultimately care whether what I build is exactly the way it works in biology or not. But I just find it interesting and inspiring that biology has achieved things that are just so amazing. I mean, like human level intelligence. And I find it fascinating that we just don't know how. And like trying to probe those gaps in my understanding, I find leads to over and over again, really deep insights in artificial intelligence, because it's like we suddenly realize, oh, wait a second, actually, there's an explanation here, which is much different than what we thought it might be. And so after graduate school, like there were a succession of those that I that I went through, we would realize that, you know, there's something missing still after like for example the neat algorithm which actually became the most used algorithm in in this sort of niche field of neuroevolution but we realized you know there's limitations on what neat can ever do 
And so they said, well, how can we get across, get around those limitations? How did nature get around those limitations? Mm-hmm. So like one example is that like in NEAT, there's this artificial DNA, which encodes the neural network. So we have to do evolution. So we have like an artificial DNA, which we call a genome. Well, it would have one gene per connection in this brain that's evolving. And like, this is clearly not going to scale, even though like this, this brain can keep expanding, but like, if you wanted to get 100 trillion connections, which is what we have in our brain right now in, in biology, we would need 100 trillion genes in NEAT. And there is no way that's ever going to happen. 100 trillion genes is, is just astronomically insanely large. And like, for example, our right, genome right. in biology only has 30,000 genes or 3 right. billion base pairs is another way of thinking about it. So so we had to invent new algorithms, and this is after, after grad school and after NEAT, that could encode much, much larger structures. We called these indirect encodings. And this led to something called HyperNeat eventually, which is a new kind of genetic encoding that is much more compact than the original NEAT. And so HyperNeat was something that I did after I left UT Austin, and, and so where, where I did that independently of Risto, and led to the ability to evolve much bigger, in effect, neural networks. And then I think one of the biggest things probably that, that, that has had a lot of impact in the field after that was something called novelty search, which is a result of discovering that in some cases, the best way to get something in a search process, and evolution is a kind of a search process, like you're searching through a space of possibilities, is to not be trying to get it. And this was a really counterintuitive and paradoxical insight, but really important, I think, for realizing how things are achieved. So in other words, if you say that you're trying to breed for something, like say we want to get human level intelligence, then right. that actually may doom you from the start. Like sometimes the only way to get to something is to not be trying to get it. And this is a hard, uh, kind of a bitter pill to swallow, but something that... What is realized? the mechanism of trying that keeps you from being able to get it? Yeah, so the mechanism there is something called deception. And actually, this is something that applies way, way outside just neuroevolution. This is a general principle for everything in life. Is you that said deception? It's called deception, yeah. It's basically okay. the, the, the situation when if you are observing that things are getting better, so it's like you have some metric for what it means to be doing well, like per, a performance metric. Like, let's say, how well are you able to walk? And so you have some metric that says, well, how well am I walking? And so normally, like if I was trying to get something to walk, I would select things, meaning I would breed things that are apparently better at walking compared to their predecessors. And that mm-hmm. I would call that their fitness. And so that's what I mean by trying. Like I keep on intentionally picking things that seem to be better. And this is a very intuitive idea. Like everybody for a long time, felt like this is obviously the way to get things to evolve, is to pick things that are better. But it turns out that if you're in a deceptive situation, which it turns out, unfortunately, you often are in, that you can be moving in the wrong direction, even though your metric for performance is going up. And that's because like, the world is really, really complicated. So it, it can appear that you're improving in some way when you're actually not. And so, for example, like, when it comes to walking, like lunging forward like a maniac and falling down like a few feet from where you started may appear to actually be an improvement in your ability to travel, you know, because basically you're getting farther than your predecessors by throwing yourself on your head like five feet in front of you. <laughs> but this is actually not a good stepping stone towards really good walking behavior. In fact, like a good stepping stone might be discovering the concept of oscillation. Like that's what your legs do. They kind of oscillate when you walk. Well, it could mm. be that when you initially discover oscillation, you fall on your face. And so it actually looks like you're not improving. And so, but because your metric is basically how far did you go, it causes you to basically be blind to the underlying discovery that's actually essential to making the progress that you need to make in the long term. And this problem of deception is just like universal across all kinds of endeavors, mm. not just neuroevolution. It's like... Is this analogous to almost like a kind of a local maxima kind of issue? Yeah, I mean, it's basically the same thing. Yeah. It's related to local maxima or local optima or premature convergence, sometimes people would call it. So getting stuck mm-hmm. on a local optimum. But I think that the insight that we have that's different from just saying, okay, well, we just rediscovered local optimum because we already knew about right, local optimum. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's just how utterly profound the problem is that mm-hmm. like you cannot just like, I mean, people think, well, you, there's ways of getting around local optimum, you know, I mean, there you, you can, there's tricks. We have diversity, we have randomness, stochasticity. There are things right. we can do to kind of jiggle things around a little so we don't just get stuck on a peak 
which is what kind of we think of local optimism as like getting stuck mm-hmm. on a peak in a big space, that like that's just not going to cut it in certain types of problems because they are just so absolutely complex that almost no matter what you do, deception is going to kill you. And we showed this when we introduced this algorithm called novelty search that in some problems that it was like shockingly terrible what deception could do to you in these spaces. Mm-hmm. And what was profound was that we showed that in certain problems like this where deception is a really big problem, and I would claim that deception is a really big problem in like almost any interesting problem, and I can kind of demonstrate that later if we want to get into it. But when it is a serious problem, then we showed that with this novelty search algorithm that we introduced, which was basically not trying to solve a problem, but rather it was just driven by selecting things that are more novel, so not things that are better, but just more novel, that this would actually be better at solving a problem that was deceptive than an algorithm that was actually explicitly being driven by selecting things that were better. So like the lesson it showed mm-hmm. is it can be better sometimes to not be trying to solve the problem than to actually try to solve the problem in terms of getting a better solution. And this is obviously really counterintuitive and paradoxical and upsetting maybe even, you know, because it's like embarrassing in a way for anybody who's like saying, okay, I've got this really good optimization algorithm to lose to an algorithm doesn't even know what kind of problem it's trying to solve. And that's sort of what novelty search is. Novelty search is a, mm. is a divergent search algorithm. So basically it's just trying to find things that are different than what it's found before. It sounds a little bit like, you know, explore, exploit where your explore is kind of optimizing for newness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is It is related to this kind of exploration, exploitation dichotomy that a lot of people talk about in machine learning. But it's also mm-hmm. different, I think. So, like, there's an additional element of insight here beyond that, which is really important, which is that when we okay. think of exploitation versus exploration, like, often we think of exploitation as following some gradient, which means information towards something that we are trying to get to. So, in other words, we're using mm-hmm. information to move in a direction that's intelligent. But mm-hmm. interestingly... Exploration, we tend to think of as sort of random moves that are sort of ignoring the informed gradient. So it's like, let's just go somewhere and see what happens. And that's what we think of exploration. But what novelty search showed is that there is a principled kind of exploration that is not random, that actually exploration is something that's also very informed. And so in the novelty search case, you're informed by where you've been because novelty is basically a comparison between where I am and where I've been before. So it's anything but random. It's it's a very informed gradient. It's just that it's the gradient of novelty instead of the gradient of the objective. And mm-hmm. this is actually a very information-rich gradient because if you think about it, you know a lot about where you've been. In fact, you know more about where you've been than you know about where you're trying to go because the whole problem with where you're trying to go is you don't know about it. Otherwise, you would just go there. Right. So novelty is actually more informed, I'd say, than the objective gradient And for this reason, it's an extremely interesting gradient to follow, like the gradient of novelty, because you're being pushed away from where you've been before. And it turns out that you you will be inevitably pushed towards higher complexity. So it's really tied into this idea of increasing complexity, because if you think about it, like as soon as you exhaust all the simple things you can do in the world, like the only choice you have if you want to continue to create novelty is to do something more complex. And so ultimately, there's an inevitability that like with novelty search that you're going to get pushed towards increasing complexity. So I think of it as almost like an information accumulator. Like in order to continue to do novel things in the world, you have to accumulate information about the world. So for example, like you could imagine if you were trapped in a room and I told you like to just do novel stuff. Like for a while, you could just run around randomly and you'd like bump into walls and and everything you do would be novel. But eventually you'd Mm -hmm. bump into all the walls in the room. And so at some point, you're going to have to learn how to not bump into walls. And when you do that, you're going to have to learn what a wall is and how to sense a wall and how to navigate walls. And eventually you have to learn how to open a door because you have to get out of the room eventually to do something new. And eventually you're going to have to get off planet Earth and go to Mars. And clearly like doing that requires like learning extremely deep and complicated facets of how the universe works, like physics. And so you're going to be forced to become an expert on the domain where you find yourself if you're going to be pushed towards doing more and more novel things. And so knowledge search actually is a very deep and interesting kind of a process. And that's why sometimes it alone will do better than actually trying to solve the problem you're trying to solve. If you think about like evolutionarily, like if you think about like how could we get to human intelligence from a single cell? It'd be crazy to do selection based on the intelligence of single-celled organisms. 
Like we wouldn't start out by applying IQ tests to single-celled organisms. That would just <laughs> kill the population. I mean, because it, it, none of them are intelligent at all. And so it's funny, but in a sense, the reason that we got to where we are today is because we were not trying to get there. Like if we had started out where selection was based on intelligence, then everything would have died or we would have gone nowhere and we wouldn't have gotten to where we are today. So we see this issue of deception come up over and over again. Like it turns out that like there was this turning point long ago, eons ago, where symmetry, bilateral symmetry was discovered. These are our ancestors. There's these bilaterally symmetric flatworms. Mm -hmm. There's no indication that it's had anything to do with being more intelligent. But actually it does in some kind of like really, really long-term sense. Like that was an important discovery that led ultimately, or stepping stone that leads ultimately to human level intelligence. But you wouldn't be able to predict that on the basis of doing an IQ test. And yet we needed to lock that in. So in some sense, we could recognize that was interesting from a novelty perspective because it was a very new innovation. But we cannot recognize it from a performance perspective because at that long, long ago point in time, it's not an indicator at all from the point of view of performance, like if the ultimate indicator is intelligence. And this is another kind of example of deception and why many things are not going to be possible to discover if we just set them as a goal and just select based on those things. And... This is a principle not just for evolution, but for life too. You know, like there are many inventions that like would not have been invented if they had been our goal to invent them, which is again the paradox coming up. Mm -hmm. Like computers, for example, were the first computers were based on vacuum tubes, but the people who invented vacuum tubes were not trying to invent computers. Like if you had gone back to the 1800s and told all the researchers working on vacuum tubes who were work, who were interested for, in, in electricity, that like actually there's something more interesting, like a computer. And maybe you should just invent that. Like, forget this boring vacuum tube stuff. You would neither have vacuum tubes nor computers. <laughs> so, like, once again, we needed people to be exploring very diverse ideas without having their eyes on the prize, if you think of the prize as like a computer, in order to eventually get the prize. And so there's a paradox right. there. And so this, prob this, this concept is so general and connected to this novelty search idea that we wrote this whole book about it called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. After a long time researching novelty search and, and a long time for me talking in various forums and venues about novelty search, and I realized that like the principles are really general about this paradox, this what I call the objective paradox, that like it's actually relevant to all society, like how we run our institutions. Like, you know, we, we give money to people based on them making progress with respect to an objective, like this is what granting agencies do, like in the sciences. And it's actually not principled in the long run. Like we have, there are other processes that need to be recognized and respected if we really want to be able to achieve really, really ambitious ends. And so that's why we wrote this book basically to introduce these principles of deception and divergent search and the objective paradox to the general public. We were hoping that maybe this would actually provoke a discussion of these things in a larger sense because of the fact that it affects many of the kind of attempts at innovation that we as a society are engaged in. So it turned out to have really broad implications across culture and society. Interesting. And then one of the papers that I noticed is one called Galactic Arms Race. Is that an extension of this work or is that a different direction? It's related. Yeah, it's related. So like we, as we started to understand this idea of, div we call it sometimes divergent search, like searches that are not aimed at a particular goal, but rather which are diverging through the space of what's possible. They're kind of searches that like show you all the cool stuff that you could find, like not just one thing, like evolution on earth is kind of like that. It's like, there's not like one thing it's trying to do. It wasn't like trying to get human level intelligence. It's kind of like illuminated all of the possible cool stuff that's out there in nature, like all of the you know diversity of nature. And so we started to realize these algorithms are really cool that, that do stuff like that perhaps for, for, uh, for applications in the real world. Like in Galactic Arms Race, the application is a video game. And our idea there was like, maybe we could put one of these divergent search algorithms in a video game so it would generate the content in the game. And you'd get more and more cool content just like flowing into the game from nowhere. Like no human has to actually design or invent it. And in the case of Galactic Arms Race, it was the weapons of the ships that you fly. Okay. Like, People are familiar in video games, like with playing games where like you have to pick up new types of lasers or weapons or guns or something like that. Right. And so we said, let's let evolution invent the weapons, but with, with a kind of a novelty search like process where it's not like aiming for like the optimal weapon. It's just diverging through the space of weapons, but with some information about how humans are actually using them. So it's informed by the humans in the game and in real time inventing new weapons for the humans to try. 
And so there's an interaction, we call it interactive evolution, between what humans do and what evolution does. And it caused like all these cool weapons to be invented, things that I don't have never seen in any other game that were just invented by the computer itself. And it's kind of, I think, a really nice exposition of like the potential of like divergent search or novelty like searches to create kind of open worlds where things are just continually generated, and sometimes we call this open-ended evolution, that are interesting and hopefully without end. What's an example of a, a type of weapon that was invented in this game? Okay, yeah, there's a couple of good ones. So, like, one was I, 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 I so there's funny, we started naming these things after the fact because they don't actually have names because they're invented <laughs> right. by the computer. But, like, one we called a tunnel maker, which would basically generate, like, two streams of particles. These are all particle weapons that would sort of, like, very slowly shoot on the left and right side of your spaceship. So basically it created a protective tunnel that you could fly through. Okay. And then in the middle of that tunnel, there was another faster stream that was actually used for, for shooting things. So you would be mm. creating basically like a shield that would like shoot out from your sides that you could then fly through. Okay. There was another one that it, we called a lasso, which it just looked like, it looked like a cowboy's lasso, you know, just like shot out and like created like this spiral around the enemy and then like closed in on it. And it was really surprising that this thing was invented. And it was kind of interesting because I actually, it's not a great weapon in, in, in an objective sense, like the lasso one. Because like, I think it's much better probably just to shoot straight at something and kill it. But, like, the players loved it because of the aesthetics. It's just so interesting and fun, like, to have the lasso weapon and to kind of show off because it was a multiplayer game so people could see each other's lassos that it became popular. And the game just kind of went with it. You know, the game didn't say this is objectively worse or objectively better. It just saw that people were interested in lassos, so it created more the lassos and diverse lassos. And we had all these lasso weapons proliferate in the world because people like them, whether they're, you know, optimal in some objective sense or not. Hmm. Is there an argument that says that the, you know, the, you know, issues around, you know, that you identified in novelty search and, you know, getting led down the wrong path? The example I guess you gave was with, you know, a robot trying to learn how to walk and kind of, yeah, using a motion that kind of allows it, that kind of doesn't lead it towards walking and, and eventually let it fall on its face. I guess the thought is, uh, are, you know, can all this be boiled down to just not being able to express enough sophistication in our objective function or not being able to express our objective function in the right time frame or something like that? Yeah, actually, there's an element of truth to that view that like, yeah, like if we knew enough about the world, we could just write the objective function to take into account how the world actually works. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that like, in practice, that's just impossible because like, you ultimately would have to know every single thing about all the stepping stones that you would have to go through to write the objective function to take that into account. So mm -hmm. it's like, say there's like, you know, a million steps between here and a human level AI. So, well, obviously, if I wrote a fitness function where your score is literally how far you are along <laughs> that path, then of course, this is like right. the ideal objective function is going to work out fine. But the whole point, the whole problem that we're facing, it just begs the question of how are we going to figure out what those stepping stones are? So we're back to square one yeah. again. And so in, in practice, like you're probably not going to be able to do that in, in even like a relatively simple problem. Because the whole problem of search is we don't know the stepping stones. If we did, we wouldn't be doing search because we would just build the thing because we would know all the steps towards how to get it. <laughs> right, right. So this paradox is basically unavoidable. You know, like it, mm. if the problem's not interesting, then we do know the stepping stones, then we don't need to do these things, but the problem's not interesting. But if the problem is interesting, it's interesting because we don't know the stepping stones. Like, that's what makes it an interesting problem. And so mm. almost any interesting problem is going to be confronting this paradox. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some cases where search will work. Obviously, it will with an objective sometimes. There's no doubt about it. In fact, Deep learning has exposed that like in really high dimensional spaces between spaces of many, many parameters, like many weights in a neural network, that there's less deception than we thought. Like, and this has been a surprise for everybody, including me. And so sometimes we still can just push sort of with brute force through the objective function because high dimensional spaces have some very odd properties and succeed at solving some problems. So we shouldn't conclude from what I'm saying that like, oh, well, the objectives are completely useless. They, they do work in some cases. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's still the case that in very, very complex problems, we are going to be facing deception. We are not going to know how to write the correct objective function to go through all those stepping stones, which are basically reflecting eons of progress to get to some of these really ambitious ends that we have. And so it's an element. It's not like everything should be done this way, but it's an ingredient that's added to our toolbox now, which is going to be important 
in concert with sometimes explicit objectives. And so it gives us kind of a powerful new tool. And this has actually led to a field called quality diversity, where we combine quality measures with kind of diversity measures okay. and try to do both at once in order to make a principled attempt to leverage what we know about both of those kinds of searches. Mm. Super interesting stuff. Kenneth, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about neuroevolution and your research. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I just, uh, I guess just to say that take a look at neuroevolution, like it's, it's actually becoming now more recognized in deep learning that, you know, we have actually a lot of synergy with deep learning because we're also doing neural networks. And so both fields, I think, are realizing today that we have something to offer each other, perhaps, you know, like neuroevolution can evolve architectures and deep learning can apply really powerful learning algorithms to those new complicated architectures for just as one example. Neuroevolution mm-hmm. can, can contribute to reinforcement learning in new ways because of the way that fitness can be a, a different kind of driver of progress than, say, the typical gradient-based approach. And so in the end, we get a possible really powerful synergy. And so I think it's worth looking at how these two things can possibly feed into each other going forward. Awesome. And what's the best way for folks to learn more about what you're doing? I'd point people to, I mean, I'm guessing you probably have some links associated with yep, the interview. We can so, include a link. And I know you've got a page on the UCF site. Is that the best one? Yeah, I'd point people to my homepage, my research group homepage, both are at UCF. And also I can provide a link to Uber AI Labs where we actually are hiring too. So if people are just interested in jobs in general, that's another opportunity there. So I'll also point to that. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Kenneth. Yeah, thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. Thanks to your support, this podcast finished the year as a top 40 technology podcast on Apple Podcasts. My producer says that one of his goals this year is to crack the top 10. And to do that, we need you to head over to your podcast app, rate the show. Hopefully we've earned your five stars and leave us a glowing review. And more importantly, share the podcast with your friends, family, coworkers, the Starbucks barista, your Uber driver, everyone who might be interested. Every review, rating, and share goes a long way, so thanks in advance. For more information on Kenneth or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimmelai.com slash talk slash 94. Of course, we would love to hear from you either via a comment on the show notes page or via Twitter to at Sam Charrington or at Twimmel AI or at Twimmel AI. Thanks once again for listening and catch you next time.